Well, it's my pleasure now to welcome you to the final part of uh, the final session of this great conference on um, uh, China AI and human rights. Uh, we are uh, extremely honored uh, to have as our closing keynote speaker, uh, the co-director of Stanford's Human-Centered uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, what we fondly call HAI, uh, Dr. Fei Fei Li. Uh, Dr. Li is the inaugural Sequoia Professor in the Computer Science Department at Stanford University. She served as director of Stanford's AI lab from 2013 to 2018. Uh, she um, has been a vice president at Google and served as chief scientist of AI ML, that's artificial intelligence, machine learning at Google Cloud. She's recognized as one of the leading experts in her fields of AI, machine learning, deep learning, uh, computer vision, and AI plus healthcare, especially ambient intelligence systems for uh, healthcare uh, delivery. She has been elected uh, and awarded uh, many prizes and honors. In particular, I will note that she is an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, I want to also uh, introduce to you again, uh, my colleague, the Executive Director of the Global Digital Policy Incubator, Eileen Donahoe, who after Dr. Lee makes her remarks, will be in conversation with Fei Fei Li. So uh, Fei Fei, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Larry, for that gracious introduction. And thank you to my Stanford colleagues, in particularly you and Eileen Donahoe for not only allowing me the opportunity to deliver these closing remarks, but also for partnering on this phenomenal multi-day seminar with the Stanford Institute for Human Center AI, where I am a co-director. So as an immigrant and American, I'm continually grateful to live in a country in which each individual matters. We may differ in our skin color, gender, wealth, or cultural heritage, but we're inherently equal when it comes to our dignity our rights and our freedom. Of course, we continue to struggle to fully live up to this ideal and much work remains to be done. But after millennia of civilization, I believe our greatest achievement as a species is the recognition of our shared inalienable humanity. As an educator and researcher in AI for the past 20 years, I've been fortunate to witness truly historic changes from the inside. First, on an academic level, then at a staggering in industrial level, and now at an increasingly complex global level. Not since the atom was split has a single technology gone from an intellectual curiosity to a force for global change so quickly. Given the speed and scale of its growth, the governance of AI is a topic in urgent need of discussion. Who will shape and control this technology? Who will benefit from it? And how might this technology be misused by individuals, corporations, or even nations? These are difficult questions but it's been heartening and uh, really riveting over the last few days to hear such an impressive panel of thinkers grapple with them so thoroughly. I immigrated to this country as a young teenager and was immediately enamored with its history and fun founding ideals. In particular, I, my reverence for the values outlined in our country's constitution has stayed with me to this day and continues to influence my point of view as a scientist and educator. No matter the form this technology takes in the years to come, 
we have a responsibility as individuals, as a nation, and as a global community to ensure that the development and deployment of AI is unanimously human-centered. That's what propelled me and my colleagues here at Stanford to start the Human Center AI Institute and motivates us every day to work on the advancement of AI research, education, policy, and outreach that can make the human condition better. I've dedicated my life to this field in part because its potential to elevate the quality of life of communities all over the world. It will be felt across much of our lives in the coming years with changes already taking shape in fields like transportation, education, and manufacturing. But what excites me the most, and where a large part of my research has been focused on for a number of years now, is the future of AI and healthcare delivery. Consider hospital-acquired infections, for example, which are implicated in the death of more than 90,000 patients every year in the United States alone. And in the time of the COVID pandemic, it's even more relevant for our patients and clinicians. By helping overworked doctors and nurses better track their hand-washing habits throughout each shift, many of these tragedies are preventable. This takes a level of consistency and rigor that even the most disciplined among us struggle with. But with AI-powered sensors installed throughout the hospital, continual awareness of hand hygiene practice becomes possible and even trivial. Sensors can serve other roles as well. Once installed, like tracking instruments during a surgical procedure to ensure proper use and proper count, recognizing when vulnerable patients are in need of immediate help, or issuing alerts when an ICU patient has gone too long without engaging in physical activity. This kind of tracking is especially helpful for seniors living in care facilities, often transformative in fact, where patient populations dramatically outnumber caretaking personnel. So what I just said is a great example of what human-centered AI looks like. Its potential for cost savings throughout a hospital are obvious, but that's not why it exists. Instead, it's motivated by a desire to make a meaningful difference in the lives of real people, caretakers, patients, and their families. Human-centered AI is also approached and should be also approached with concerns like privacy in mind. In our own work, we began our research by in-depth conversations with clinicians and patients to hear their concerns for privacy. We work continuously with bioethicists to understand the ethical impl implications and to explore the best possible technical approaches re respecting that framework. We've demonstrated how sensors that record only depth rather than full color information can help preserve accuracy while obscuring individual identities. And we've, we've been working with computer security experts to develop secure and privacy aware machine learning algorithms, including differential privacy and federated learning approaches. Above all else, human-centered AI is intended to augment humans' capabilities rather than replace them. As a daughter of two aging parents, I've spent a lot of time in the hospitals, from surgery rooms to ICUs to emergency departments, and I'm always struck by how deeply human the medical profession really is. This isn't something I can imagine changing. Many of our lives have been enriched by our relationships with caretakers, especially in times of need. And this technology is intended to support them, not to interfere or replace. 
But not all applications of AI are built with these values in mind. More and more, we're witnessing this technology's capacity for harm when it's deployed without concern for fairness, transparency, and human benefit. A prime example is algorithmic bias. For years, analysts have been studying the potential for AI to reinforce age-old human prejudices, especially when machine learning models are trained on biased sources of data. Additionally, the explainability of AI, that is, a model's capacity to explain how its conclusions are reached in terms, in terms a human can verify and understand, has been an active topic of research in recent years and continues to evolve. This kind of accountability and transparency is especially vital when AI plays a decision-making role in finance, medical treatments, or criminal justice. Even worse is the active malicious use of AI. The term deep fake, for example, has entered the cultural lexicon in recent years as generative machine learning models have demonstrated their ability to spin lifelike imagery from thin air. And the recent GPT-3, the third generation of OpenAI's new text generating model can write remarkably believable prose on nearly any topic with minimal human oversight. Democracy depends on an informed electorate and we have a responsibility to ask what its future look like when the media voters consume, uh, when the media voters consume can be so easily and effectively manipulated. In the extreme, AI is not merely malicious, but a vehicle for digital authoritarianism at a national scale. We've heard in this conference how authoritarian governments are using AI to surveil and suppress their citizens, to censor and stifle dissent, and to promote a, des a desired narrative, if not outright disinformation. As this technology becomes more powerful, more affordable, and more widely deployed, corporations and states alike will wield unprecedented control over individuals. This is why it's so important that democratic institutions across the world stay informed and work together to identify and combat such abuses of this technology and build a world in which all AI is human-centered. It is for these reasons I co-founded the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, which we commonly refer to as HAI, with Professor John H. Mendy, Stanford's former provost and a philosopher. The goal of HAI has been to just not just study the technology of AI, but to also address the societal implications of this technology. Now, by not only ensuring the designers and creators of AI are of diverse backgrounds and perspectives, but also fostering a pathway for various stakeholders to be present at the creation of this technology. At HAI, we have included people across disciplines from law, engineering, philosophy, neuroscience, to the humanities and social sciences. And we have looked beyond academia to include government, civil society, and in industry at the table of these critical discussions and developments. For AI to serve the collective needs of humanity, we must include insights from all of these fields and buy in from all of these stakeholders. HAI is guided by three intellectual tenets. First, we must recognize AI is no longer a niche computer science and technological field of study. Its human and societal impact are too profound. We must invite social scientists and humanists to participate and oftentimes to lead the study of AI's societal impact 
to understand it deeply and to forecast the changes and to guide policy. Second, as I shared in my healthcare example, instead of replacing humans, which so many fear, AI should augment human capability and amplify our ability to do more. My colleagues and friends around Stanford are working on how to use AI and machine learning or data-driven technologies to make the human experiences better, safer, or more productive, including education, manufacturing, agriculture, healthcare, and beyond. This brings me to the final important tenet. If we want AI to collaborate and interact positively with humans, this technology should be more inspired by the intricacies of human intelligence and behaviors, whether it's humans' superb capa capability of flexible learning, creative thinking, or our ways of expressing and experiencing emotions and compassion. But America is so much more than Silicon Valley. I've seen firsthand how much talent lies just beneath the surface. surface. Often far from the coastal regions, we tend to disproportionately favor. By, but even in 2020, so much of this country's talent remains untapped often due to historical imbalances in opportunity that have yet to be fully resolved. That's why I started AI for All with a student of mine named Olga Rusikovsky as a K-12 education nonprofit designed to bring teenagers from traditionally underrepresented groups into many universities' AI labs across the country for real hands-on experiences with this technology each summer. We started with Stanford AI Lab in 2015, and even in this past COVID summer, through online format, we invited nearly 500 students to 16 different university campuses, from California to Pennsylvania, from Arizona to Georgia. This includes girls and people of color, but we're also eager to reach students of all kinds, uh, students of all kinds from the rural communities and low income neighborhoods so often left out of the tech world. Organizations like HAI and AI for All highlight the need for a broad multi stakeholder approach to designing and deploying AI. Ultimately, this will have to extend to the national level. I believe the United States remains a powerful force for change, even amidst such historical technological advancement. A big part of this power is our proud and often underappreciated tradition of funding revolutionary research, which serves as both a complement and a counterbalance to industrial research. Government-funded innovation has contributed so much to the modern world, from the internet to mapping of the human genome, and those contributions must continue in the age of AI. This country has also built a principled reputation on human rights, and AI challenges us to live up to it at an ever-growing scale. This means speaking out against the abuses of human rights from AI and even using AI to uncover and counter repressive use of it. It means using diplomacy to advance a vision of technology governance that embodies our values, working with like-minded countries across the world and building an effort such as the OECD AI principles and the work of the Global Partnership on AI, GPAI. Next, American universities, which remain some of the most influential and resourceful institutions on earth, are positioned to play a major role in fostering a global culture of human-centered AI. In particular, as educators in engineering and computer science, we have an obligation 
to ensure our students are learning as much about technology as they are about the world that the technology will affect, such as Harvard's embedded ethics curriculum in their computer science classes, or Stanford's pioneering class on computers, ethics, and public policy. The world needs a new generation of socially conscious, ethically minded innovators to lead the way, and we can play a role in shaping how they think. There's also more specific actions that can be taken immediately. In recent months, HAI has worked with our Congress to establish a task force to study and create a pathway for, for creating a national research cloud, which would allocate considerable resources for AI research outside of the commercial sector, giving our country's students researchers and NGOs a route to make novel, meaningful contributions to the field, especially those focused on problems without an immediate financial reward. As the power and accessibility of AI grows, the temptation to use it in ethically questionable ways will only grow all over the world by taking a principled stand in favor of a resolutely human-centered approach, the United States has an opportunity to lead. At its core, authoritarianism is a doctrine of exclusion. It's the idea that power should be reserved only for a select elite. In contrast, our strength lies in our embrace of inclusion that everyone can play a role. This is an idea reflected in science itself, where your ideas matter, not your status. But as the expression goes, freedom isn't free. It takes vigilance to ensure this circle of inclusion continues to expand. As the power of AI grows and the desire to harness it grows with it, we must recognize that the counterpart to our freedom is the responsibility to protect it. This is a responsibility that falls on all of us. Scientists and researchers who must always imagine their work in the context of the people it may one day impact. Industry leaders who have a growing obligation to consider the societal impact of their business decisions from the technology in their products to the partnerships they form across the world. Policymakers who must work to stay informed and provide a thoughtful counterbalance to these forces. Electorates all over the world who can use their voting power to tell their leaders that technology should serve people and never the other way around. And educators who have an opportunity with each new class to shape the thinkers of tomorrow, ensuring they're not just smart, but ethical, compassionate, and committed to building a world worth living in. The power of AI may be great, but I believe the power of human ingenuity is and remains far greater. So while regimes with malicious aim may harness AI itself, a threat we must continue to take seriously. They'll never harness the ingenuity driving it the way a free society can. Of course, it takes more than virtue to stand up to authoritarianism. So it's important that we recognize our values aren't just moral goods, but competitive advantages with lower but with lower barriers to entry and a commitment to inclusion, we can tap into the full talent of our population. A culture of candor and open debate encourages the critique of bad ideas and the support of good ones. And transparency in both our technology and our leadership fosters trust and a willingness to collaborate 
with our citizens, corporations, and our allies on the world stage. This is a powerful foundation, not just for innovation, not just for innovating, but for recognizing threats to human rights wherever they may emerge and organizing a principled stand against them. I often quote my friend and colleague, philosopher Shannon Vailer, who is thinking on these matters, has great, whose thinking on these matters has greatly influenced my own. She once said that there are no independent machine values. Rather, machine values are human values. It's a reminder that no matter how autonomous or sophisticated, our technology will always be our responsibility. That even the most advanced intelligent machines are merely extensions of our own intelligence, our best, our worst, and everything in between. As, re as I reflect on the ideas of our presenters over the last week, Shannon's words have taken on a simpler form. In order to build a future in which AI supports democracy, the democracies of today must support AI. Thank you. Feifei, thank you so much for being part of this program. Thank you, Aline, for inviting me. I can't convey how appreciative we are to be able to have this opportunity to collaborate. And I have to say, personally, your story is so inspiring. Thank you. But, so your comments um, did such a good job of reminding us of this complex balance between the vast potential benefits that can come from AI, but also the complex range of downside risks. Um, you reminded us we ha all have to be vigilant in protecting our values, including privacy, inclusion, fairness, transparency, and that we have a shared responsibility to protect humanity from malign uses of AI, especially in authoritarian contexts. Um, so as a starting place, um, I want to join your question, your comment about who benefits from AI with your own commitment to inclusion that has been so clear. And I wanna bring this sort of to the global level. We know around the world, there are whole communities, countries, regions, that for a wide variety of reasons are not sharing in the benefits of AI. Given that roughly 40% of the planet is still not digitally connected, it is probably fair to assume that these people are also not adequately reflected in the data that feeds AI, and they are certainly not part of the coding community that is building AI. And this lack of inclusion can have really dramatic um, consequences and even exacerbate existing digital divides and create many new ones. So I'm wondering how you think about these global challenges of inclusion in and exclusion from AI and what Stanford HAI is doing about it. Yeah, thank you, Eileen, for asking such an important question. Um, you know, this has kept me awake for many years now, and uh, that was why I started AI for All, because of the lack of inclusion. And now this, uh, um, this question of equity, inclusion, and fairness is now on a global scale. And, uh, you know, as a field, especially a technical field about 60 years old, we haven't paid enough attention to this in the early development of AI. Now we're already seeing severe negative consequences. Just an, as an example you alluded to, uh, just recently my wonderful medical school colleagues just published a JAMA paper showing that most of the healthcare models trained um, with machine learning algorithms are using data from only three states in America, California, Massachusetts, and New York. And this is a significant bias and will have downstream impact in the people who, who this is serving. And internationally, this disparity is even greater, right? Like you said, with entire countries or continents underrepresented or not represented at all. So, First of all, I, I still believe the best approach, one of the best approaches is to bake equity and inclusion into the design of AI. This is too important to be left as a patch or afterthoughts or statements. For example, 
you must think how you will source data and how, how what the data is representing before you write a line of code. And there are technical solutions like work like data sheet, but there are also important regulatory efforts. And uh, I also mentioned in the talk that a multi-stakeholder approach is critical and the key. We have to invite all stakeholders broadly representing the groups this might impact um, to the table from the get-go. Technology um, can be a force of good. It actually can call out a lack of inclusion or bias if we use it right. Um, for example, it also, you know, through telehealth, especially in COVID time, we could potentially reach people living in their homes or remotely. Um, but, you know, we have to have the will and the incentive to use technology for good. And at the end, it's still all about people. I'm an educator as much as I'm a scientist, and I firmly believe that um, the future is in, in the hands of all of us. And, uh, you know, we need to focus on inviting America's youth to participate in AI today and become tomorrow's leaders, especially those with all walks of life and traditionally underserved communities. Well, let's bring it even closer to home and talk a little bit more about the Stanford Human Centered uh, AI approach, which I would say is still quite unique in the field. Um, I still remember your early New York Times op-ed uh, entitled Making AI That's Good for People, which was really striking. Um, and then soon thereafter, Stanford announced its strategic initiative around this rubric of human centeredness, which for me was wonderful as a human rights advocate. Um, I think this was really notable because it was not that long ago that there was a very dominant strand of thinking among technologists in Silicon Valley that technology should not be bound up with normative considerations. And that the, the basic idea being that technology was value neutral and that tech progress should not even be impeded by values-based concerns. So I, I guess I'm curious, was there any resistance within the Stanford CS community about using this human-centered approach? Well, thank you, Eileen, for recognizing Stanford is uh, at the forefront of that. I remember early conversations with you back two or three years ago, and you were at the forefront of thinking about human-centered AI, and I was very inspired by you. So, of course, we would not have today's Stanford HAI if it were not for the enthusiastic participation and leadership from many of the computer science colleagues here at Stanford, released to name a few, James Landing, Chris Manning, Surya Ganguly, faculty members of the AI lab, engineering leaders, uh, John Mitchell, Jennifer Widom, university leadership, Persis and Mark Desir Levine, who are both scientists by training. So there is, I, I do feel a cultural shift. I do feel people are recognizing the importance of the human centeredness of, uh, of the <clears throat> technology. But it's also an ongoing, um, unfinished job, right? Um, we do have technologists at Stanford or in Silicon Valley or worldwide who claim that we're just building the tools. I, I respect that, but that's not where I stand and I wanna help build that bridge. And uh, HAI at Stanford partnering with Hoover, with you guys, with FSI, with CEPR, and many organizations is doing exactly that. We, we need, you know, I mentioned in my talk, the three intellectual tenets of, of AI, whether it's human inspired technology or human augmenting te technology or, or it's uh, societal or human impact. The, human must be at the center of technological development. So just staying on that theme, as a sign of how much things have changed in terms of this relationship between technology and values, HAI recently set out a communication to the Stanford community reflecting on HAI's responsibility to help combat race-based discrimination and bias. And it included your recognition, here's a quote, 
we are we are aware that technologies are not neutral in design or impact and that there are no machine values only human values as you said in your comments the hard question is you know we we know we have to have much more inclusive data but but the harder part seems to be how do we make sure that our values are embedded in the design and reflected in the design of AI and that the values we want reinforced show up rather than the ones we're struggling to overcome in society? Yeah, no, great question, Eileen. And, uh, you know, we cannot just put things in statements. We have to put them in action. And uh, again, I emphasize on a multi-stakeholder approach to, to know there's no single solution. Uh, but at Stanford, we have multiple avenues to approach this, right? First and foremost, we're an educational institute. So to ensure AI um, or any technology's future uh, to be more inclusive and equitable, we need, need to include all walks of life to participate and to bring those youth and, and, and young people in. Um, traditionally, if you look at the statistics of CS majors, or especially AI track, or graduate student numbers, it's not great. The number of faculty in AI um, coming from uh, underrepresented groups is also not great. But um, um, as a community, whether it's computer science or HAI, we've taken this uh, criticisms and public oversights to heart. We've been increasing our leadership composition to people of all backgrounds. We have continued to outreach to AI researchers of all backgrounds. We have established, as you notice, this diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion committee to, um, to force us into um, uh, structured action and commit to those actions. And we're working closely with organizations like uh, AI for all, blacking AI, and so on. So that's education. But we also want to improve research cu uh, culture, baking the ethics into the, the design. Um, I'm actually very proud. And as far as I know, HAI is the first institute, not only in Stanford, but probably nationwide uh, in AI, that is now requiring an, an ethics review process for every research proposal that we plan to fund. And this is led by a group of faculty leaders, Michael Bernstein from Computer Science, Deborah Satz from uh, Humanities, um, and Margaret Levy from Political Science. And um, this is the kind of forcing function that will um, gradually shift the culture. And also we continue to uh, convene and participate in the convening and learning from experts and leaders. I want to serve as a hub to this kind of inclusive conversation. Uh, one example was our fall conference back in uh, 2019 on AI governance and policy. We included voices from ACLU, uh, from Algorithmic Justice League, from the White House, from the partnership in AI, along with our nation's leading scholars in technology, governance, cybersecurity, political science, ethics, law, and more. And then recently, we held a uh, facial recognition technology workshop where, um, again, from uh, ACLU, from uh, Justice uh, Algorithm Justice League, to industry leaders, to uh, governments like um, uh, NIST, um, and, and, and academians come and and uh, have that kind of open, transparent, and inclusive conversation. So just to conclude, conclude this multi-stakeholder stakeholder approach is one important way to ensure inclusion. So um, I wanna highlight one of the most inspiring lines from your comments was this uh, sentence, I believe our greatest achievements as a species is the recognition of our shared inalienable humanity. And that really sounds like human rights language to me. Um, as you know, this whole program um, has revolved around and used human rights as the normative lens through which to assess the impact of AI on people and on humanity. Um, we believe that the human rights framework provides a really strong basis for assessing the impact of AI. 
And we also think it's valuable because it has served as the normative pillar of the post-World War II international order for the past 70 years. And so it's a very much globally recognized concepts and language. And several uh, US-based private sector AI companies, explicitly Microsoft as a leader in this, have turned to human rights impact assessments rather than just ethical evaluations, human rights impact assessments to evaluate the effects of their products and services. And I'm curious whether HAI has ever considered using human rights language when considering the impacts of AI. Yeah, so uh, we're, um, we are all and continue to be students of human rights. The 1948 uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN explicitly committed us to the notion that there are um, a certain set of rights and freedom inherent to all of humanity. So it is important to all of us to ensure that technologies we develop and deploy not only respect those rights, and uh, wherever possible, further them. So I cannot speak for everyone at HAI or in AI, but I want to just uh, highlight three small, uh, quick examples of uh, where I see this is happening. Um, one example is my own healthcare work that um, part of human rights declaration talks about privacy and di dignity. And uh, this is something we pay close attention when we work with our bioethicists and our stakeholders like patients, care uh, takers and clinicians about respecting their privacy and dignity and how we can design this AI smart sensor technology to, to help their recovery, health uh, medical recovery while respecting their privacy and dignity. Um, another example um, is actually uh, related to human rights um, um, of the most vulnerable population in the world. And this is uh, Professor Jens um, uh, Heimoller's work from political science department and also supported by HAI research grant. He and his uh, machine learning colleagues work on how to use data-driven machine learning methods to improve refugee and immigration policies, including bettering the refugee placement uh, process. And this is very much motivated by that. Last but not least, um, HAI is also a community of incredible talents. Our very own HAI International Policy Fellow, Marici Shaki, was a Dutch and European Union politician. And she is now an uh, outspoken voice in technology, governance, democracy, and human rights. Well, that, yes, Marich is a very good friend and we're all very pleased she's part of this Stanford community now. Yeah, So definitely. I think last question, because we've taken up a lot of your time. Um, I want to talk about uh, High's efforts to help the United States stay competitive, which you referenced in your comments. It's competitive in AI research and development, as well as in the field of AI education. Um, you also emphasize the special attraction to and draw of American universities from students and researchers around the world, due in large part because of our open liberal democratic values, which is at the heart of our education system. You yourself were one of those brilliant minds drawn to the United States, and you are now a globally renowned professor and scientist helping the United States stay at the top of the field. So, Last question, from your vantage point, what can and must the United States do, not only to preserve our open values-driven education system, but to ensure that US universities have the opportunity to continue to draw students from around the world and to be a beacon to those who want to study in the United States? Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Of course, uh, I totally agree with you. I cannot agree more that America has played such a special role in the last uh, century or at least many decades to, uh, to, for being this most fertile ground for innovation in science and technology. We mentioned internet, GPS, gene sequencing, uh, laser, uh, of course, AI, just to name a few, right? And um, as we both agree, 
our values, our, our free open society, our entrepreneurial spirit are part of our competitive advantage. And I would like to see the values preserved. I would like to see we continue to support the most innovative scientific work. And of course, we need to adapt to today's challenges from inclusion to continued um, path for immigration of world talent to ethical development of this technology. Uh, we need collaborations among government, higher education, civil society, industry, and, and especially the support of our nation's research community. I actually wanna share with you um, as a closing uh, remark, a story of a student called Stephanie, and she's uh, an alumni of AI for All, a daughter of a single mother immigrant from uh, Mexico. Stephanie grew up in the trailer parks in the strawberry fields of Central California but she found her passion in computer science and AI as a high schooler. So she came to uh, AI for All at Stanford campus during her high school freshman summer. And she fell in love with machine learning and was determined to use this technology to help her community. So she went back to Salinas, California and used data-driven methods to study water qualities of her community. And she's now a college freshman at Stanford pursuing her passion in computer science. So having crossed paths and taught a student like Stephanie is both her American story and mine. It really humbles me that our system um, welcomed people like Stephanie and me and can continue to support students and future leaders like Stephanie through education, through research and um, and through a shared passion to use technology for good. And we need more of this. So um, that's, uh, that's how I feel about this. Thank you. I have to say your story and your work is so inspiring. And I just wanna thank you again for being part of the program and really giving us a chance to underscore and highlight the very unique interdisciplinary nature of the Stanford Human Centered AI initiative. Thank, thank you, you Eileen, so and thank you, Larry. Um, this work has only just begun. We have a lot of shared work to do. <laughs> yeah.